Norseman Ventures with Je and Janet Reiner, Psychic. Psychic. It's the visit with the person of high strangeness. I have an exciting show for you today. Um, before I tell you where we're going, I wanted to tell you I got the new program for uh, the new season, and I looked at the uh, type of programming that's on the show, that's on the on the on the station, and I wanted to uh, really thank my viewer for being as loyal as you are, because I realized that there is is totally different things ahead of me and after me. So for those thousands of you that come by every week and remember it's Tuesday night at nine, I really appreciate that. So today we're going to uh, go into Janet uh, Reiner's house and we're going to talk to Jeffrey Davis, a historian and a ghost hunter and he's holding the camera and what else? What else? Uh, author. An author, yeah, we, we're going to do that. and. Uh, so just come along for your visit and we'll try to enlighten you to some weird stuff, or maybe not. So come right along, okay? And this would be the lady. Janet Reiner, hello. And how are you? Fine, how's it going? It's going. It's going? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you remember how we met? Um, how did we meet? I feel like I've known you forever. Besides that, yeah. <laughs> well, let's see, you and I, I met your daughter, mm -hmm. and your daughter gave me your name and phone number, mm -hmm. and I got, I called you and talked with you, and told you the situation that Jeff and I, you know, Jeff is mm -hmm. a ghostwriter and I'm a psychic, mm -hmm. and I just sort of thought it would be interesting to have a conversation with you. And you came in route of Bob's and friends. Uh, the viewers are very familiar with that. Barbara so, O'Neill. Yeah, there. so they probably saw you uh, walk into the feeding of the Actually, I started hungry. Hmm? I volunteered for the Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, so they've probably seen you there. Yeah, probably, probably. Okay. And hello, Jeff. Hello, how are you today? I'm fine. And you came, how did you end up? Well, actually, Janet asked me to come by. Uh, she and I have known each other for about a decade. I was doing a book reading in mm -hmm. Olympia, Washington, and uh, we were just about to start, and this woman came running up all out of breath and said, is this where the ghost writer is talking? And I said, yeah, it is. And so we ended up meeting up and talking, and I think we talked for another two and a half hours after that, and that was about a decade ago. That's how we do that. Yeah, and that's how we do that. The traffic you hear is on, well, wherever we are, I can't tell you where we are. That's a secret. Um, then when you came, you had sore feet. Yeah, it's because uh, I had a fire walk that went a little wrong. Mm -hmm. This would be, I think, my fifth fire walk, and I didn't concentrate enough. And so, uh, so I stepped in the wrong place, and if you believe in mind over matter, uh, my mind didn't matter quite so much. And uh, but what's was funny is when I was looking at the video inside my head, uh -huh. I thought I screamed. But if you watch the video or when I watch the video, I just said, "Ow, that hurt." That hurts. Uh, do we have a video, or do, do I have the video, or should I send them to your website? Uh, you can actually on YouTube. I'm Ghost Guy Zero One. That's where I have posted some videos, including a firewalk video. Ghost Guy uh, Zero One. Zero One on YouTube. And they walks on fire. Yeah. It's an air show in Olympia de Mar, so they, they are practicing. Oh, that's what that is. Uh-huh. So when I got here, you made a steak. Yeah. And, uh -huh. Oh, I was going to say, I must have been psychic because I had three steaks. You had three steaks, uh-huh, and I eat when, I work better when I'm hungry, so I've made an exception. Uh. Well, I'm glad you did because... Uh, it was a darn good steak. It was, yes it was. I wish I'd taken a picture of it. And here is the lady the house. Um, so from what I understand, the two of you work together. So who, who wants to start about how you got from here to here, from there to here? Um, I, I'll go ahead and start. Janice mm -hmm. awful shy. I'm cool. Just, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, 
Janet, from when we met, um, in, in writing books on ghosts and doing paranormal investigations, I've been approached by hundreds, maybe over a thousand people, all who sincerely believe that they're intuitive, clairvoyant, or psychic. They and do. They do. <laughs> And, and as you and your viewers probably know, everybody's had a flash of insight at least once in their life, but how consistent are they? And, uh, and Janet is pretty consistent, and so I actually kind of made a, a practice to take her around to some places and to kind of test her in a way. She was pretty good-natured about that. I wouldn't tell her anything about the haunt mm -hmm. until, uh, until after she made all of her observations. And... Uh, so in other words, you go backwards. Yes. You start from double blind, it's called, and then go work backwards. Is that what you do? Right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes I'll know facts, or I will make sure I don't even know facts. I'll just show up at the police mm -hmm. with kind of bare, bare information that both of us have to have, like a street address, but the, the day before. Yeah, but I've actually shown the viewers how that works. Yeah, how we do this backwards. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and, and I approach it, my training is an archaeologist and historian, oh. so I approach it kind of that way. This is not necessarily me out to debunk or to prove the paranormal, it's telling people stories. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and then I understand you got approached by a to do a documentary, was it that, is it a show? Um, this, a couple of years ago, the History Channel used to have a series called Haunted History. Haunted History, that's what it was. And, uh, it, you know, went all over the country to, like, San Antonio, New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I was a consultant on the Northwest episode. And mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, periodically, they will go ahead and play it around Halloween, and I'll get mm -hmm. an upsurge of contacts. Uh, usually these days, people say, oh my God, you look so young. Huh, this was yeah. About eight years ago that I did that. And and we you did obtain permission for us to show a little bit of that. Is that the one that we can use a clip from? Oh no, that's a different one. I'm sorry. Oh, that's a different one. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I did one. That was me solo. Uh, Janet and I were both approached by the Lincoln County, which is on the Oregon coast. That's the, the one. City. Yeah. And they said, you know, we're trying to interest people in coming to the coast over the winter time, and what's mm -hmm. more perfect than Halloween ghost hunting on the coast. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, they approached us and some other people, and they sponsored a video and they took really good care of us. And uh, we went to visit several haunted places along the coast. So, I'm gonna, we're gonna work a little of that in here. Okay. And then uh, end up uh, going to Janet for a minute. Oregon coast is hauntingly beautiful and tourists have been coming to the central Oregon coast in the autumn for decades. Some have apparently liked it so much that they decided to stay even after their death. In this edition of Oregon Coast Explorer, we'll visit two haunted restaurants. We'll visit a bay that is port call to many frequent ghost ship sightings. We'll share some spooky legends and we'll visit with some local ghostbusters about why the Oregon coast is the place to be a ghost. On this very special presentation of Oregon Ghost Explorer. to come into service at the Devil's Lake Fire Department. It has a long history. Now, according to some local firemen and paranormal investigators, it also has a volunteer fireman that makes it his eternal home. Seems like uh, lots of people have strange sensations there. And um, I've always experienced something there, even when this new addition to the building was finished and everything was brand new, you go back there and, and 
it always seems cold. Even in the summer, it's always cold in that room, as well as the fact there's, there's no windows. And uh, I remember once going in there and the, the door closed behind me. <clears throat> and I had trouble finding a light switch and just a moment of anxiety there. Uh, we had a female firefighter that used to run duty shifts here and she um, would stay only in our dispatch room or out here by the engines. She said um, at night she felt really eerie in the hallways and upstairs and she just had a yucky feeling and she didn't feel safe or comfortable. It was about, uh, about three or four in the morning and uh, just sounded like somebody walking upstairs and walking past my dorm room and and I then walk back downstairs and hear a door shut but this this is really eerie a couple of years ago on my way through town after work I stopped by one afternoon to have a visit and said hello to everyone downstairs went upstairs to get a soda out of the cooler in our day room and noticed that there was an older gentleman sleeping on the couch upstairs which is a volunteer uh, sleeper quarters and uh, you know, when you discover someone sleeping unexpectedly, and, and I didn't recognize the, the man, and you know, I felt kind of embarrassed, so I went back downstairs and mentioned to Kathleen that I'd seen someone that I didn't recognize sleeping on the couch up there, and I said, well, who is that? And she said, I don't know, there shouldn't be anyone there. And a couple of minutes later, she went upstairs and checked, and she didn't find anyone. I walked in, and I saw two fire trucks, and I sensed a presence, but I didn't know who it was. And my first, is I went to the red fire truck and the red fire truck I sat down and like I like I do like I normally do I sat down and I I allowed the quietness and the meditation to take over and the presence got very strong and I allowed his um, his essence to go ahead and infiltrate my body per se and the emotion and, and through these emotions I get visions sometimes and one of the visions that I had was that it is an old gentleman he has white sh white hair whether it's salt and pepper or white there is white in his hair he is a gentleman who um, had problems with his heart sadness a lot of sadness mainly guilt mainly guilt and that when he when he passed away, I, felt, I think what had happened was, I think what had happened is when he was dying, either he was dying on the way, and then he happened to have been in the truck when he died. It's like uh, you're being watched or something, like you, you shouldn't really be there. That's somebody else's territory. And these days, that's the, the back bay is where we store our old engines. The original TND and Devil's Lake old engines are stored back there. Well, and that's where our man likes to stay. ocean is such a magical place, it's no wonder that spirits seem to lurk near its shores. To find out why ghosts seem to like the coast, we asked our paranormal experts. Why is the Oregon coast uh, a good place to look for hauntings? That's an interesting question because it's uh, it relates really to a lot in the past because you have a lot of emotional events going on uh, on the coast. It's a lot more primal because you're right next to the ocean. And even today, a lot of the livelihood of people on the coast is really tied to the sea, you know, fishermen, recreation, and, and sometimes the sea is not a safe place. So you've got people with a lot of anxiety and a lot of potential tragedies happening along the coast. And, and that can lead to, these tragedies can lead to, to ghosts and hauntings. And not only that, you've also got uh, a large Native American population here in prehistoric times. And uh, there are a lot of sacred places on and around the coast. Uh, there are some perhaps right here in Lincoln City. And, uh, and so these sacred places and these concentrations of Indians uh, can also lead to that. And uh, another thing that's really maybe promotes places being haunted is you've got people living in the same houses for generations where you have uh, people build a house and then their children live in the house and even their grandchildren so you've got a little bit more of this family in the same house and that might encourage a grandparent to stick around after death to see their family continue living.
almost lost your head. The Christie School. Yeah, I do. Yeah. The Christie School. They're uh, talking shop here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, the, no, 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 we were one of the things that we one of the investigations we went on was the Christie School, and, which, and, which was a girls' orphanage in Portland, and. Uh, you know, even before that, though, when you called me and told me about, you know, asked me if I want to go on an investigation, the first words out of my mouth was, is this an elementary school? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I want to double back for a minute. Uh, before we start the clip, uh, Jeff mentioned Halloween. And uh, you as the psychic, uh, I want to get your opinion. Why is the post you always want to play ghost stories on Halloween? I think people want to be scared no matter what. That's a good answer. Yeah, I think so. And I think we, you know, people who want to be scared, you know, whether it's Halloween or not, they just want to be scared. And you know what? I like to frighten them too. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Especially my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just said, hey, let's get back to the Christie School. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Because uh, it was another one of these interesting things. We actually had a newspaper reporter for a Halloween segment. Mm -hmm. On the, I think it was a Portland Tribune or News Tribune, and uh, the reporter was very polite, being English, but he was also very much like, why did I get stuck with this assignment? And it was interesting because he'd done background investigative work on the place, and what had happened was this was a girls' orphanage, and shortly after they uh, opened it up, the flu epidemic came in the early 1900s, and, and many of the children died. Mm. But in addition to which. Uh, there was actually a blocked up room where they had actually nailed the door shut and had built a whole set of, of wall lockers Quarantine. over the door. Well, what ended up happening was Janet came to that point and she said, there's no ghost here, but... I said, there's a, I feel a lot of sexual charge energy there and it's not, it's not where it was a male. I felt it was a male and there's a male, male presence there, but there was a lot of sexually charged energy that was coming out of there. And then and after the report came out, Paul got a phone call from an elderly lady. Look she, this way, they oh, know. I'm sorry. <laughs> she she ended up he ended up getting a call from an elderly lady mm -hmm. and the elderly lady said she used to live, be part of that Christie school, and when she was there she was abused by one of the men that were there and was ended up uh, her and her her and her sister are filing were filing charges and was in the middle of a lawsuit against the mm -hmm. church that was running the school. Isn't it amazing how we, how we, oh, what do you want to call it, we construct things and it's just there and we can see it so vividly. Do you yeah. perceive it or you, do you see it? I feel it. You feel it? Okay. That's one of my, that's one of my abilities is being able to, you know, when I sense or when I touch people, I, I get a download of information. Mm -hmm. And then I also perceive it. I see things, you know, in my third eye and I'm able to pick things up from people. And, mm -hmm. well, yeah. Well, in addition to which, um, uh, actually, she tried smudging Paul before we left, and I kind of made a few jokes about it, and he ended up, something ended up following him home. Paul. Paul, Paul. Duchenne was the reporter. Oh, the reporter, yeah. And uh, he, he's now a believer. And yeah. mm -hmm. what ended up happening was he related this to me, that when he was home, he had a gravel driveway, and he had a floodlight, so he was emptying mm -hmm. his car. And uh, he was walking around, and he was making, you know, like crunch, crunch, crunch. And then he stopped, and there were crunches behind, behind him. behind him, yeah. And uh, and over the next two weeks, he started waking up in the middle of the night, and he actually perceived a young boy at the foot of his bed, kind of peeking around, peeking around his brass, you know, like the brass rails of his bed. And uh, Janet ended up calling me before I talked to Paul and said, "Ask Paul how he's sleeping." Mm -hmm. And uh, and she felt that he'd been followed home. And I and I told her ahead, I told him ahead, told you ahead of time, it's going to be a young boy, 13, 14 years old, He's, and there's an affinity because this child is also English. And, yeah. uh, so it was one of these interesting things where we weren't even trying to convince anyone. We we are not. Sometimes uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to you for a minute. Zip, that was kind of quick. Uh, but you know, uh, when people say, "Oh, I'm not into this," or "I don't believe in this." And sometimes, even my lectures, I, I want to say, who cares? Mm -hmm. There it is, you know? I think one of the challenges we have is that we, as children, we're told, children are very psychic to begin with. And then, as children are very innocent, they're very psychic, and then as they start telling this to their parents, the parents go, it's your imagination. Oh, no, 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 you're not right. It's, it's, it's not what you think it is. And they, so they rationalize it away, 
justify it away, and the children are taught not to think about it, not to okay. deal with it. You can keep talking if you want to now. You see, see all that disturbance that seems to be in the camera? I can see it. What? It's not smoke. I'm talking to the viewers for a minute. It's not smoke. It's not nothing, but something is moving here. So yeah, it's my. I have an entity that's in this house. Uh -huh. Do you see him? Uh, I don't know what we see, but you are a little distorted, and yes. it's jumping up and down, and it's not a technical. No, it's my, I, in this in this place. I have about a dozen entities that are mm -hmm. in this, and they live here very freely. I very nice people. One of which is a very is a twenty four year old man, and there's another one that's about. Uh, a 50, 60 year old man as well. Do you see him? I don't know. I'm going to do a still and see if we can capture him. You keep talking and I'll see if we can no, find him. No, you don't have a problem with it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I am not psychic. Um, no. if, if I could mention this, uh, if anyone's curious about the Christie School, Janet's website actually has two, uh, two PDF, you know, Adobe Acrobat documents that are the two newspaper articles Paul Duchenne wrote. Mm -hmm. If I could mention her website, it's absolutely. It's, it's a, I thought of the name, not her, so blame me. It's mistressofmysteries.com, mm -hmm. all one word, and uh, and it's in there. I think in documents. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of look around and you'll see it. And uh, uh, to me, this is always very interesting when you're talking about the distortions and effects because I'm not psychic. I can see it. No, it I, you, it, it looks like I'm having technical disturbances in the camera. You know. Uh huh. Yeah. So, you know, being not psychic, I'm really lucky that nothing's ever followed me home. But then again, I kind of miss the, you know, miss part of the knowing, if I can say that. I, I've not seen an apparition, but I have had a, a port once or twice, and I have had effects. I've had cold spots and, and just about everything in the literature, but I've just never seen an apparition. you got flashes all over you. So, um, that is so cool. Now we got it. We sit sideways, <laughs> just so you can see. You was telling me about, um, I forgot where we were going with that. Oh, uh, we oh. were actually talking about the fact that you had had a director who was saying, what are you doing letting all your guests talk? You should be the one doing all the talking. You're That's the what it was, yeah. And you said, no, my, my audience knows who I am. It's the people. Mm -hmm. and, and I had agreed with you. I did two actual mobilizations for the Army as a military historian. And uh, I spent several months in Afghanistan going from fire base to fire base, interviewing soldiers about their experiences. And, and how do you get their experiences if you do all the talking? That's right. How do you, we get here, get the lady here, how do you get stuff if you do all the talking? Which brings me back to what we were talking about. What's that? Well, we wasn't going about it this way exactly, but I know in some of the ghost shows on TV, the psychics go in and they say, whoever you are, come out, come out, whoever you are. And then when they do, they say, ah, they freak out. You don't do that, do you? Do you? Do you? You know, it's really funny because in my experience, when you call out to them, they don't necessarily show up when they, when you call out to them, they sort of show up when they feel like it. And sometimes they come even when you don't feel like it. And you know, here's one of the challenges that I have for, from, um, on these ghost shows is, um, you don't necessarily see them as, in your eye, you, you see them in your third eye. Like uh -huh. I see them in my third eye, and then you feel them. You feel their essence. And um, you know, some of these go like the Ghost Hunter International. Uh huh. Great show. Not realistic, but great show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, come on, I love that show. I like it too. Everything in there is true. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Then why is it? Why is it that when they when they go ghost hunting, all the lights are out? Well, I actually sent somebody who was who was interested in ghost hunting, mm -hmm. I, I actually said, why don't you email them and find out? Mm -hmm. Why do they always turn off the lights? Mm -hmm. and, and I believe the response was something like, well, you know, we started off as plumbers by day and ghost hunters by night, so we just got used to doing stuff at night. I know who you're talking about. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, a, a true psychic and a true ghost, I see them all the time, mm -hmm. in the middle of the day, in the middle of, you know, in the house. Well, and that's very true. If you believe ghosts are an extension of human existence, when are people most active? People most active in the daytime. So what you're going to get is you're going to get ghosts that are most active during the daytime, not at night. So we just don't perceive them because we're too busy during the day. Yeah. Oh, okay, now, Jeff, I have a question for you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh -huh. here. 
You still you still currently in the reserves? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. So you're. Uh, you say you're not intuitive, but um, I don't know about that. So how do you? Um, that's a saw. We are outside. No, that's a motorcycle. motorcycle. When you go in a military type situation, uh -huh. uh, do you, co do you combine the two? Does it give you comfort or does it distract you from other things? Um, I've been doing this, I've been in the military off and on for over 30 years. So it's. 30 years? I'm older than I look. Uh, it could be because I sold my soul. No, no, I never sold. No, <laughs> yeah, you I did. did. <laughs> My family's very long lived. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 17 years old when I first enlisted. So, when you I lied about your age? No, no, it was still, oh, allowed, still allowed. Okay. But okay. Uh, so it's it's almost like asking me when I put on a uniform. It's like putting on a glove that I've had mm -hmm. or a jacket that I've had for years. Uh, good times, bad times. I don't think that I would have not joined up, but there have been some bad times too. Uh huh. And then Janet, you are. Um, I'm a real estate agent. Real estate agent. You, you combine but, your gift with your... You know, it's really interesting how psychic, some psychics get into certain occupations. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, being a psychic, I've been a psychic all my life. My first encounter with my guardian angel was when I was five years old. I heard a knock, you know, I cracked my knuckles. Mm -hmm. And at, in the evening, I would hear the same pattern on the closet door. And that was my first encounter with my guardian angels. And it's interesting because, you know, I go into these homes and some of these homes are very haunted. And it, some good, some bad, you know, and everything in between. And then people, and some real estate agents wonder why they can't sell their homes. Well, the reason why they can't sell, you know, the listings is because they're haunted. And the haunting actually causes challenges with the buyers. Yeah. And most people don't think about these but things. But they are buyer lists that people are looking for places like that. That's where you go in a case like that. Well, sometimes. But mm -hmm. what happens also is that the enter if the entity is in the house and the entity doesn't like the buyer, they will manipulate the transaction. They will manipulate issues and challenges so that the buyers end up not buying the home. Beetlejuice. Uh, uh, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. <laughs> in fact, here, a perfect example. There was a transaction here in, in Olympia and the listing agent was in and out of contract eight times within six months okay and what happened is I said you know the house is haunted I need you know if you want me to smudge it I'll do it it's can can you tell the difference I'm not neglecting your stuff can you tell the difference between a spirit and in like a, something in a, in a different time in a uh, interdimensional or in a different time frame, we have a lot of Native American spirits. Yes. Can you know the difference between that? I, I sense the energy. I, I feel the energy. It just so happens that the house that 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 particular house that was in and out of contract, I think it eight times. It was uh, two women that were in the house, uh -huh. and they were stuck, and they just didn't like the buyers. And I helped them cross over, and I helped it. I smudged the house. That property also had other issues too. They had some dead animals wandering around, um, disembodied souls you know of, uh -huh. of animals but when you once once the energy crossed over that after i smudged the house at noon and by three o'clock she had her she, she had her first she had a an offer and it closed 20 days later cool but that happens quite frequently and most agents are not aware of it mm -hmm. i'm gonna pause this for a minute because it's so noisy hang on a minute here i'm not editing so you're gonna go right along with me Carson, we were talking about Johnny Carson. Yeah, it's really interesting. I uh, I wrote a book or co-wrote a book some time ago called Weird Washington, and uh, it's part of a national series. Each state gets a book on how weird it is, and one of the stories that got pulled, I don't know why, uh, involved Johnny Carson. The according to the people at the place called the Hotel de Haro in the San Juan Islands, uh, Johnny Carson had a yacht and he passed his last summer up in the San Juan Islands. I actually remember that, yeah, true story. And uh, he used to, um, he had like a little rider cart, mm -hmm. and he used to, uh, they, they used to like park it on the dock next to his boat, and then he would get in it, and then he would trundle to the end of the wharf, and then he would get off on a bench, and he would smoke a cigar, which he shouldn't have done because he had emphysema, and read a newspaper and people watch all day long, and they call it the Johnny Carson bench. Cool. Now, now you think of it as an oxymoron. You, at the end of your life, and people tell you you're not supposed to smoke cigar. Uh, no, can you believe that? 
I know, we're all that guilty well, of that. Some addictions just are very difficult to, to stop. Um, we had a family type thing, and most of the, my smoker friends had electronic cigarettes. Now, if, if they give me the same grounding effect than what I have, I might try that. Have you seen them? Well, you know, it's interesting. We talked about that before. You, you ground yourself uh -huh. on smoking. Yeah. You know, psychics, if, if people in the paranormal, they ground, them, ground themselves in many ways. Some, a lot of psychics, they eat. Mm -hmm. I go to sleep. Not me. Yeah, but then you wonder. You told me when I got here, you told me you was wondering while you're sleeping. So you don't know what I you do, do right? I, there are times in which you're right. I when I sleep, next thing I know, I'll have people from other states say, you know, you came and visited me, mm -hmm. and I remember seeing you. And it's like I don't remember that at all. Okay. <laughs> now I know that I, I used to work at Boeing's. Um, we do the paranormal affairs and things like that. And when I left it, you would have some like, uh, mm, uh, let's see, there was uh, eight hours, so you could do maybe 16 readings. And when I left it, I would have to head for the closest steakhouse and eat an almost raw steak. Yes. Or else I, I couldn't come out of whatever yeah. I was doing, you know. And you know, that's a challenge with some psychics, yeah. is, is, you know, a lot of times to reground themselves, yeah. you end up having. You know, the individual habit is not a bad habit, but it's the volume. Yeah. So a lot of psychics do eat to, to reground themselves. Mm -hmm. Me, on the other hand, I have to go into an empty room where it's dark, where it's quiet, by myself, and go to sleep. And then what happens is when I go to sleep, evidently I travel around. And I stay home and smack my brains out. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Astro projection, that's what I Oops, do. Oops, I'm <laughs> kicking the... So what do you do for um, grounding? Uh. Not being psychic, grounding, okay. Uh, well, yeah, but but everybody gets a little loopy, don't you think? Oh, you yeah. Were with, we, we were together when, when we had the other psychic with us, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just thinking, one of the things Janet also does is she gets interrupted in the middle of grounding herself is she grows six inches, turns green, her clothes rip off, and she like throws things, including myself, about the building. <laughs> uh, Maybe you want to start, start smoking or something, huh? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, it was, it was, before I started writing professionally, just sitting down with a good book, a familiar book, not a new one, but some book that I really, really loved, that would kind of take me back, uh, especially if it was a book I read as a kid. Uh, now that I spent all this time researching and writing professionally, kind of the thrill is gone. So uh, I play Civilization too, and I try and take over the world and then the universe. That's How are you doing on it? Uh, I'm not doing too bad. I, I've actually ended up becoming uh, Emperor Jeff the Terrible several times, <laughs> as far as my rating goes. Mm. Mm. So realization started to kick in. Well, Jeff Would you happen to have a book in this library that belongs to you? <laughs> there is. Um, there is? Oh, cool. Okay. Both of them. Well, well, let's see it. Here is, here is Weird Washington. Okay, let me zoom in. So you're gonna get this. See? Angle. Hey. How's that? Weird washing. Yeah. Oh, I got it. Okay. And we have weird organs right here. Actually, we have. We have all the books there. This book that I just dropped on the floor. Ouch! That hurt a lot. It's all in your mind. It's all mind over matter. That's yeah, what they I, tell I me. Yeah, I focus myself. This is what I want. This is, a, this is a haunted tour guide to the Pacific Northwest. West. This is one of my more popular books. It is currently under revision. Revision. All right, I got it. It should be, mm -hmm. the new the new edition should be out in time for Halloween. Halloween. And <laughs> maybe 200 haunted places in the Pacific Northwest. And You've been to the Cooney Mansion? Which mansion? Cooney Mansion in Cosmopolis. No, but I'll have to remember that one. Hot Lake. Hot Lake. Well, Hot Lake doesn't... See, what I, what I try to do with the tour guide is get places that... Nobody's been. I've been to all of those, so go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, no, no, for, this is more along the lines of for people who want like a, a ghost hunter getaway weekend. So right, you, yeah, that's what we were talking about, about, about the real estate, you know. Right. People really, uh, this one place in Florence, Colorado, was a haunted hotel. And once it was listed at that, man, I mean, the sky was the limit. Right, but see, with real estate agents, 
if they're smart enough to recognize that that's what it is, the challenge comes in is the sellers. A lot of times sellers don't realize that it's haunted. Real estate agents are afraid to put it in because they don't, they don't, they're afraid that there won't be any buyers to come and, you know, and purchase it. Mm -hmm. the, the people who are interested in haunted houses are really that, are very far and few in between. They are there, but they're very far and few in between. Mm -hmm. well, okay, you so say you have three books? Um, actually, get, get I, I've, written eight, I've written eight books on my own, and uh, and then two for Barnes & Noble. But what I was also going to say about the, the tour guide is places like the Hot Lake Hotel don't want to publicize themselves as being haunted. Well, you know, all the ghosts are gone except the one that we left, the piano player. Right. Yeah, there were 23 in there, and we actually, uh, maybe I'll re air it, I t we took the viewers with us as we was exploring things so they could see what we saw. Uh huh. Have you been to Seabed? Hmm? Seabed, Washington? No. There is a conference center there called Seabed Conference Center. Uh huh. And every year um, they go out, every year they have these, uh, uh, what is it, um, family camps that are there. That place is one of the most haunted places I know of. Yeah, unfortunately they don't want to be listed as a haunted place. So the, the places in the tour guide are ones that said, yeah, go ahead and put us in, or they never bothered responding one way or the next. So. Yeah. And that's one of the challenges when you're dealing with haunted places is, you know, we always assume, oh, this is cool, it's haunted. But you know what? A lot of times the sellers or the owners of the properties, the managers of the businesses, they don't want to be known as haunted. Well, and on the other hand, because of all the popularity of the Ghost Hunting TV shows, a bunch of hotels have contacted me and said, hey, why don't you list us in our tour guide? And, and some of them are totally fake. They're all invented hauntings. So now tell me, um, your, your, your sideline, mm -hmm. you can make a living? Uh, or are you like me and you give it away? It's, it's a hobby that pays for itself. Hobby pays for itself. And so a lot of times with the profit I make at it, gets reinvested into mm -hmm. fun projects. One of the things that I do is I also put on talks on mm -hmm. interest, what to me are interesting things. I have a talk on Jack the Ripper, so I mm -hmm. travel to London, spent a week in London. I have a friend who's a ripperologist, so there a whole bunch of money went in researching that. Mm -hmm. Same thing, Lizzie Borden, and uh, I just got back from a, a long trip to Hollywood for Hollywood murders. Hollywood murders, yeah. They, um, I got a call from a nursing home one time. They wanted me to come in and give a talk on alien abduction. And I said, isn't it a little drastic for the old folks? And they said, oh, no, no. I said, don't you want to start them up with crop circles? And they said, oh, no. So we went for months. I went there on Fridays and um, once a month. And we filmed things and we talked to everybody. And by the time we got ready to put the show together, the HEPA law had just went into effect and we couldn't tell the story and we couldn't show the pictures. Sad, huh? Um, Something similar happened. Um, I was asked to come to a uh, resident care facility. People were not ambulatory. They weren't able to move mm -hmm. outside the facility. And they said, can you bring pictures? And that is how they travel, is by public speakers who come in mm -hmm. with video and photos and a good story to tell. And that was mind-blowing in a way. It, it, it's one of these things where I should have known that that's exactly you know the release for these people. Mm -hmm. and so I was really happy to come in and talk to him, and I'm scheduled to come in in October for Halloween. Jana. Yes. You are in charge of the world. <laughs> Am I in charge of the world? No, you are. Oh, okay. What are you going to do? What do you mean, what am I going to do? You, you're in charge of the world. What, what are you going to do? Domination. World domination? After I dominate the world, go for universal domination? Is that what it is? No. <laughs> you know, it's funny because you asked a question to Jeff about... Do I, is, do I make a, a living on my sideline or at, at this? You know, it's funny because I act, I've been asked this question a lot, and that is, you mm -hmm. know, do I Not cousins. Those two questions are not related, huh? Cousins? Yeah, they're not even related. Cousins? Uh, yeah, the question. That was his question. The, my question to you was, you are in charge of the world. Okay. What are you going to do? I think I would, I would teach the fact that um, monetary dominance is not is not really the sole uh, purpose of life. I think a lot of times we, learn, we tend to lose focus of what the priorities need to be in life. 
Um, I think as you get older, people begin to realize that all the time that you work and stay at work and make, make tons and tons of money, what the reality of is you lose that relationship you have with your family and the relationship that you have, you know, not just your immediate family, but other friends and stuff like that. I think we spend too much time working and, and being having money as a priority versus having um, relationships and peace and compassion and those and having that should be a priority. Mm -hmm. I think if I was in charge of the world, I would say, no, you know. not if you are. Okay. You are. When I am. <laughs> no, right this minute. Okay. For sake of this question, you are. Okay, I'm, if I'm, when, uh, okay, I am in charge of the world and I say, really, we need to shift our priorities away from money and possessions and, and have more towards giving and developing relationships and having peace. Mm -hmm. And you, Jeff? You're in charge of the world here. There are people going to be raising more beef. Mm. Because I'm sure your readers will agree we all need to eat more steak. <laughs> one thing. Oh, greater, actually greater care in the past. As an archaeologist, I saw so many Native American sites and American historic sites all bulldozed in the name of progress. And I think that's wrong. And so I think I would mandate uh, a lot more a lot more education, historic preservation, and uh, knowing the past. Uh -huh. I think we lose touch with compassion as well. Now, John, now what you was going to say earlier, we were talking about uh, using your passion to, to make a living off of it. Now we're going to let you go that way. Oh, okay. Um, I find it, you know, I ask, I'm asked that question a lot, you know, um, but I feel that the gift that I have is actually a gift from God. And really the gift from God needs to be, give, since it was given for free, it needs to be given away for free. But I don't think God demands that you starve to death. I know, and that's been a real challenge. It's been a real issue. You know, when I go in and smudge places, I smudge it for free. If somebody comes to me and asks me for help, even if they don't have any money, I'm there to help them. Because that's well, the way it should be. That was kind of set up for what I'm going to say here. Oh, okay. So, listen up, folks. I still do readings. Mm -hmm. I, um, this for my viewers. <laughs> yeah. and then, I, I, let me say this. I still do view, I still do uh, readings, just so you know. Uh, I still charge because I do need tapes and gas and steaks for Jeff. Or you want to talk to me? And so um, I will talk to you and tell you um, anything. But come reading time, um, I appreciate your support. You know what? And that's very true. And here's here's been my here's been my growth. You know, when I was younger and I, and I for, was first developing this skill, I was just giving it away. But here's the challenge is as more people come, I've learned that my time is valuable. It is valuable, you know, it's valuable. My time is worth money. And even though I do certain things for free, I am learning that as I grow and develop as a psychic, that I really add a necessity. And because of the time I spend with a person, that really I need to start spending or charging some money or a donation. Lots of times, if it's free, people give it no validity. That's true. That's now, true. In, uh, for instance, let's say you sell called Avon or cosmetics. Mm -hmm. You say, here, try this. Try this sample. And a week later, it costs you money when you order it. That's true. A week later, you go say, did your face fall off? Oh, no, I didn't use it. Well, why not? Well, it fell in the sink. Hmm. Now, had you said, give me $5 and try this, it mm -hmm. would not have fell in the sink. It would have respected I mean. it a lot yeah. more. Yeah. That's and right. Then, yeah. And that's, what, that's one of the challenges that I have, not challenges, one of the it's one of the growth developments that I have as a psychic is recognizing that any time you give something away for free, there really isn't any value to it. Now, when, once you start charging, all of a sudden they have to take money out, then they're saying, oh, mm, I have to start listening. They, what they did a little, uh, a little thing here, um, I don't know what it was, research of it just worked out like that. This very, very famous violist. Uh, that makes enormous amounts of money. He, he went to one of those uh, uh, subway mm -hmm. stations mm -hmm. and played, and they hadn't, didn't have a clue who he was. Yeah. And they wouldn't even put money in his little no. cup. No. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and it's fu people are funny that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, when you, like for instance, like when I do the smudging, I, I smudge it. But now that, now that I'm saying, you know what, I, I need to be paid for my time, 
sometimes when people are used to receiving something for free, they sort of feel insulted if you start charging. And, but you know what? You're absolutely right. My time is worth a lot of money, and, it, it is, and if I keep giving away, if I keep giving things away, I won't have anything to give away. Well, and recently, Janet did a talk at a local college, and um, she, this one young lady, ended up asking her for a consultation. Remember that? Multiple times. And well, and one consultation turned into what she calling you Six. three times, three times a day, okay. asking for for more readings and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And I wasn't charging her. And but you know what? Here's the challenge is I should be charging her. Every but time I pick up the phone it takes me away from when you else. when you do that many consultations for one person, you not we're not helping when we do that because we we start living their life for them. And that's not very helpful. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. And here's the other thing. I think it, it's a matter of respect as well. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of does this person respect me enough to know, recognize that time is, is money for me. And, you know, every time I'm on the phone with somebody else, it takes me away from other business that I should be doing. So, you know, it's part of my development is, is recognizing that time really is money and I do need to charge. Mm -hmm. it, and uh, you make your money with the books, and uh, are you like all of us? Uh, we are. Well, you already said you use the money to do something else with it. So, so suppose you retire tomorrow, are you going to have time to go to work? Good question. I find myself at an age like a lot of people do. I think the last bastion of job discrimination is age, and um, so if I stopped writing, and I'm very soon going to be retiring from the military, I will have to plug that financial hole. And I do have I do have some VA benefits, so I might go back to school. Mm -hmm. And I, I am interested in the exciting world of air conditioning and heating repair, which is about the only. Program so I'm so you're on. gonna make you're going to make time. Oh yeah, that's right. You're not psychic, so of course you can answer that the way. I was I was trying to move them a certain way. It's not gonna work. How about this? This is a very perfect time. He's gonna work the camera, and I'm gonna talk to Jenna for a minute here. We were talking about we were, I, what I was trying to do. Tell him to tell me if he's going to have time to go to work after he retires. And uh, so when you retire, are you going to have time to go to work? You mean with, as a psychic? Uh, no, like a job job, like a okay. part-time job job where they pay you. You know, with the way the economy is going, I probably would have to go back to work. I think, I think the ultimate the ultimate job, even even before I retire, even after retirement, is to can, is to do what I enjoy, and that is teaching about the paranormal, teaching about the guardian angels, talking about um, things like spirits and ghosts and, and and demons and angels and things like that. And, and um, I'm you know to do lectures around at different universities. I think that would be really fun. It'd be nice. Now, when you work your passion, mm -hmm. you're not going to have time to go to work work. And you wonder how you ever had the time to do it in the first place because you're gonna get so busy doing what you like. But you know what? Isn't that the ultimate? Isn't that the ultimate benefit? Is being able to do your passion. Your passion. Yes. In fact, the Aborigines of Australia have a. Um, they don't have a word for work. So if you don't like it, you're not gonna do it. Cool. I think it, I think it'd be fabulous being able to to work your passion. Isn't that what the ultimate um, joy of life is? Mm -hmm. What's the ultimate joy of life? We're going fast, aren't we? Well, well you know, I, it's funny. I was reading in a book, and somebody started off saying uh, the ultimate joy in life is sex, money, power, food, sex, and more sex. And steaks. And steaks. Well, food, steaks. yeah. Beef is what's for dinner. Uh -huh. So cool. But Janet actually likes beef, too, which is highly unusual. More well, beef than Janet. That's right. I like chicken. I can't eat chicken. How can something no. that smells so bad taste so good? I like buffalo. Me too. When I'm a challenge with chicken. It's funny because I, when I eat chicken, can you feel the sense of the energy of the chicken that you're eating? No, but I can feel the antibiotics and all the genetically engineered yes. crap. That's what yes. I feel I want yeah. chicken. No, I find because whenever I eat chicken, I'm very sensitive, and I feel the fear. I feel the energies of the chicken. I had a lay. I had a friend. She broke out right around here. Every time she ate chicken, she just broke Ooh. out in hives. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, so tell me. Um, 
uh, what's your next gig? Do you have anything planned? Um, you, if you pause that, I'll trade seats with you. Okay, because I'm... Well, and we can visualize a lot of things sometimes. It doesn't work for me. The visualization it doesn't board, work for you. It doesn't work for me. Just oh, like well. we said, you know, a lot of times we're always taught to focus on something and it'll come to you. Focus on it and work towards it and it'll come to you. That doesn't work for me. I always have to think about something and then forget about it and then it'll come if I'm lucky. The rest of it just plod along and pay for it. We have to talk loud. Oh, the rest of us just plod along and then pay for it. Plot along and pay for it. Oh, I'm visualizing that. <laughs> I mean, you probably have more success with it than I do. It's okay. Hmm. I gotta think about that too. Yeah, we talked about that before. You know. Mm hmm. Some, some people, some people are really good at that, and some people are not. That doesn't work for me. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I was telling you the story. I, I when I filmed for Offord Lake, uh, I didn't have any music, so I thought, well. It, boy, if I had some sap, my, one of my favorite bands, I could really put some sap in here. And then right about then, Ron Matthews called me from sap. And he said, my ears are ringing. Are you paging me? I said, yeah, I want to use your footage. He said, fine. Now, that was uh, pretty bizarre, you know. So they often got sap. Mm -hmm. well, you must be psychic for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> any, uh, any thoughts? I mean, any advice? Any... Um, well, one of the things I've, I've learned a long time ago, uh, Charles Dickens said it best, even though now it's a little outdated, he said, every man is the hero of his own story, and every person is the hero of their own story. And so that's how I approach research and writing, is treating everybody like they're a hero. Mm -hmm. And they will open up and they will talk, and they're more accepting. If you can go to a haunted, haunted house or a funeral haunted house, and then demonstrate to them that it's actually uh, an intermittent stream that pops up in, after rainstorms. And that's what's causing that rattling. They're mm -hmm. more accepting of that rather than if you treat them with suspicion and ridicule. If you was in charge of the production of a ghost show, would you superimpose? I'm sorry, would I? Would you superimpose ghosts for visual? There are, there are different different sh kinds of shows. When I did this haunted history uh -huh. and this other this this other show that uh, on the Oregon coast, that was more along the lines of, of a reenactment. Uh, uh, right, but if you are in charge of a show like that, how would you proceed on that? I I might well do that so long as everybody in my viewing audience knew that, that it was, it was a reenactment. reenactment. And that's, a, that's the problem that I have with the current ghost hunting TV shows is uh -huh. they, they're not reenactments. They are wandering around in a dark building with night shot cameras, scaring themselves. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's a lot spookier and, and humma, humma, humma. But mm -hmm. I don't like those kind of shows very much for that. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have to say they, they mainstream it. They mainstream psychic. They mainstream the paranormal. And so we owe them a debt for that. We do. We do, but here's the challenge that I see, and I'm not going to take away from that, but people who are really, who are true paranormalists, they recognize that that's not the way it works. And so when a person, an everyday person, goes into a haunted, a haunted space, mm -hmm. and then they wonder why it didn't work out the way they saw it at Ghost, Ghost, how, was it Ghost Hunters oh, International, sure. they wonder, well, it didn't work out that way on show. Well, it's because that's not reality. This is reality. And so, and that's one of the challenges I have with them, is that... Yeah, yeah we're kind of on the same page there, because it's really hard to uh, see, see, I've actually shown the viewers how, me as an amateur, how I can put them in settings, in places they've never been, I can make them say things they never said, mm -hmm. uh, I can make them do things they never thought they could, mm -hmm. and just because you see it on TV doesn't mean that's how it is. No, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other thing... Just before a paranormal event happens, music does not queue up to let you know. Something ghostly is going to happen. No, that uh, okay, Jenna, closing thought? Oh, I'm sorry? You have the closing thought. Uh, closing thought? I think everybody has paranormal abilities. I think we've been taught when they're very, people have been taught when they're very young to ignore it. 
or to rational it away, rationalize, rationalize it away. I think everybody has the ability, it's just that uh, most people are not in tune to it. So I've never considered myself special. I just tell people and I teach people, you have the ability to, you just need to listen to your, your gut feeling, you need to listen to your heart, and you need to listen to your, and communicate with your guardian angels. Cool. If you? Uh, I couldn't say it more. Couldn't say it more. More better. More, more better. More better. More more better. better. <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. You have some wonderful paintings here. Do you paint? I do not. You do not? Okay, yeah. well, Jay. But she buys from the best. She buys from the best. Cool. <laughs> I guess what we're going to do then, um, we're going to have Randy Shaw sing us out. You know what? We're going to have Randy Shaw sing us out. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's my closing song, oh. and we'll come back next week and uh, you know back in the house the, we, I don't know if you want to take a look at the house but the the, the, the spirits in there are a little anxious but what, what it is you're not moving around you see it's totally different it, it's totally different I'm not sure what we got but I got something mm -hmm. uh, because now you're just as clear as a bell mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny because when I'm in the house by myself, mm -hmm. they're just wandering around. And upstairs, if, I don't know if you've taken a shot upstairs, but upstairs... No, I can't make stairs. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, they're... Unless you want to go up for a minute. It's, it's, um, it's a teenager's loft. Oh, yeah, we're not going there. <laughs> All right. Well, no. Okay. Yeah, but you're just as clear as a bell right now. Okay. And so we, we did actually... When I'm, when I go to bed, mm -hmm. I tell my the, I tell all the the disembodied souls that are there. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed in the space, and I sm I have to smudge my house at least once a week or I'm sorry once a month. Yeah. But when I they leave the house, they don't come into this space. They go into the backyard, and then when and then they they know that when I'm walking around first thing in the morning, they're allowed to come back in. But every day it's in and out, in and out, in and out. So we're gonna give you a new title. The spirit trainer. <laughs> okay, hey, this is it. We gotta go. And uh, thank you for coming. You came a long ways, and you live here now that I found your house. We'll do this again if you don't mind. Absolutely. And then uh, till next week. Mm -hmm. Bye. 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 This is just because you. Thank you.